Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. You need to dive into all those things and, and understand for that person specifically that you're selling to, um, what does, you know, if they were king for a day or queen for a day and they could say, this is what the perfect situation is. This is what the perfect customer and client experience looks like for me. Understanding what that is and how that impacts their day to day. And then, and then making sure that you package yourself as something that creates the result. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with podcaster and co-host of Podthon, Lee Wehara, and with the wealth mentor, Jackson Milan, then do check them out, but only after you've listened to today's episode, of course. Now, I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Mike Moll of Market Me Consulting. He is a strategy and marketing consultant who helps executives and entrepreneurs turn their skill set into a sustainable consulting business. Mike is also host of the Market Me podcast, a strategy podcast that covers marketing, covers content strategy and business development. In our discussion today, Mike talked to me about solving problems that people have right now. We talked about the importance of good systems and processes, and we talked about the importance of videos to build a personal connection and differentiate yourself. Without further ado, then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Mike Moll. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from a niche in Portugal, Mike Moll, who's a business strategy, branding, and marketing consultant and host of the Market Me podcast. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Mike. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. Uh, it's a complete honor, and uh, thank you for having me. Now, you're... No doubt the first guest I've had on from Portugal, although you are actually based in, well, you, you're you from Toronto, Canada, but you are a digital nomad. So we'll probably talk a little bit about that as well as we go on. Karan Nijuan, who was our guest on episode 333 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you and introduced us. So big hello to Karan. Love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I've also had the privilege of being your guest on the Market Me podcast, and I'm really looking forward to continuing our conversation that we started there. Now, yeah. one of the things I was fascinated to learn when I was reading about you, you say you've created your own income pretty well all your, all your professional career. You've survived through two big economic downturns, and you're still going strong and adapted to all the things the environment's thrown your way. What was it that sustained you through all the ups and downs that, that no doubt everyone experiences? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, to be transparent, the first one, I, I don't know. I, I didn't think I was going to survive. The first time I ever had 70% of my clients drop off in a week, I thought the world was going to end. Um, I went into you know crippling, crippling. I, I don't know if it was depression, but just there's just this mood and everything kind of sinks out because 
I think as an entrepreneur, you have this, you know, imposter syndrome and this feeling sometimes of, am I good enough? Or are they going to find out? I don't know what I'm doing. Even if you, you know, even if you know what you're doing. So to have a whole, you know, 70, 80% of your income to just drop off, you're like, the days come. I knew it was coming. I knew it was going to happen. And even though it's nothing to do with you, there's that feeling of what could I have done better? What did I do wrong? And so the first time was really, really, really tough. And it, it took me a long time. It took me a long time to kind of bounce back mentally from it. This most recent time where it was kind of same deal, marketing is usually the first thing to go when the economy gets tough. Um, I was a lot more prepared uh, mentally and just infrastructure wise. And so I think the thing that sustained us this time is uh, the ability to adapt your products and to pivot based on what do people need now? Not what they needed before, but in their current status, in their current state, what do they need now and solving that problem instead of trying to fix what they needed before. Hmm. Yeah, I like the focus on solve the problem they need right now. Cause, and as you say, that's changed quite dramatically through the pandemic and certainly when when the economy turns down dramatically when there's a recession people do tighten the marketing budget and they i remember when i first started the um 2008 financial crisis hit fairly soon thereafter and what people needed then were websites because a lot of businesses didn't have them so that that was kind of my pivot then even though i wasn't that keen on doing websites per se, but what I recognized very quickly was the website was the way to teach them about marketing. Yep. It's a good way in. They're they're kind of a pain to they're kind of a pain to deal with, but if they get you to the marketing conversation, then so be it. <laughs> mm. All right. Now I touched on the digital nomad part of your existence before. So what how did you get started as a digital nomad and, and what is it like? Uh, you know, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, we, you know, had to actually postpone it for quite a long time. I had a period where uh, my mom and my grandfather got sick at the same time. My grandfather didn't make the recovery, but my mom did. And, and we had actually planned to leave uh, to Thailand and Australia for a year at that time. This was three years ago, three or four years ago. And, um, you know, that was a kind of a hard, tough pill to swallow, but you know, you stick around, you deal, you help your family when they, when they need it. And it was almost a succession right after everyone got healthy again, more people got sick. And so we kind of stayed and stayed and stayed. Um, for me, I've been fully remote for seven years. My team's been fully remote for that entire time. So I've been able to move around a little bit and, you know, have extended stays where most people would have to kind of get back to the office, which has been great. But this year we, you know, fully, fully embraced it. We left for Mexico in February. Our plan was to be there for four years. And then we were going to British Columbia and then Costa Rica. Um, obviously the pandemic dramatically changed that. <laughs> we ended up staying in mm -hmm. Mexico for five and a half months or so. Uh, we happened to be in this amazing little town, all the tourists and everybody kind of fled. And so we had this little, island not quite an island but this little you know paradise in the jungle all to ourselves for the entire thing so we experienced the pandemic very very differently um we now are in portugal we've been here for about two and a half months uh it's been great i mean traveling obviously is a little bit strange getting on a plane is a little bit you know there's something a bit nerve-wracking about it still but to be honest most of the planes are pretty empty at this point so it's been you know relatively easy and for us, because we work from home and we don't have a lot of outside requirements, we're able to stay distance most of the time. So what, what are some of the things that you do to enable you to actually carry out your work while you're remotely located? Um, I think the biggest thing, what it comes down to is systems. I think that was something that I failed at really, really early on. I just thought, take on as many projects as possible, say yes, just go, go, go. And, uh, you know, it really hurts you. It makes you in this, this constantly busy, constantly frantic state where you're trying to always feeling like you got to catch up. So what we did is we, we really narrowed down what we offered. We started saying, a, we started saying no more often than we started saying yes. And we took things that were higher margin, um, that we could, you know, successfully outsource portions of, 
Um, and then we just built a great project management system that allows us to work a lot less and still make the same money that we used to. Mm. Yeah, there's a couple of really great things in there that I think are worth unpacking some more. So you talked about systems um, and outsourcing. H how do those two things work together and what are, what are some of the critical components? I think what you need to think about early is, are you the person that can run the system? For me, I'm not the guy. I am very disorganized. I'm a very creative, sporadic thinker. Um, to get me to check my email or send a follow-up invoice is just about impossible. What I did very early on is I, I realized that I was not, I was going to be the person that held me back. Um, at the time, early on, I actually had my sister who was on maternity leave. She was looking for something to do. And I said, hey, I, I, I'm out of money. So could you check out and collect some of these invoices? And she went into the, she went into the invoicing software I was using and said, you've never followed up on any of these. Do you know how much money is just sitting here? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure there's some, can you figure it out? And so she actually, uh, she actually didn't go back to her other job and ended up coming on full time with me. And she was an absolute rock star, um, you know, organized. Um, t she, she was very meticulous and she was very good at the tedious things. And she built with my kind of uh, framework of how a customer would want to interact. She built a lot of the systems for us and, and a lot of the stuff that we use today um, and and I'll, I'll always be thankful for that because I don't know that it would have gone as well as it did if she wasn't there. Hmm. <laughs> so bringing somebody on that, that's got that mindset and that uh, is good at writing the systems and setting them up and, and is focused on just that. Yeah, I mean, I think the beautiful thing about it is there is so much amazing technology that even if you are terrible, I mean, truthfully, if I had to do it, I'm sure, you know, you, you do what you have to do to get the, get the job done. Um, you know, we've used uh, a number of different project management softwares, but they're just, those things are just amazing. I mean, they can keep track of anything you need. We, you know, we've gone through a couple. We now are using Airtable, which is kind of just an open source spreadsheet style database. And we find it very, very lean, very simple. It sends us reminders of stuff when we need it. Um, allows us to communicate back and forth. Uh, the thing I love about it is when we've outsourced a project to somebody, we, you know, we've got all of their details in um, so we can see how many projects an individual is working on, the deadlines of those projects. And so we can kind of at a glance, take a look at what the next week, two weeks, a month is going to look like and really plan for, a, plan for it ahead of time because we have everything in a project management software. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's um, particularly the idea. Uh, now, I haven't used Airtable for project management, but I, I really love the idea that you can sort of see at a glance the resource demand versus what's what they've actually got on. So, you know, can you take on a new project and resource that effectively in the time frame that the customer expects? Yeah, absolutely. And the nice thing about Airtable is uh, it's, you know, it's kind of designed as this open source. It can do anything you put your mind to, which, you know, is tough to wrap your head around. Okay, then how do I turn it into this exact tool? Um, but they have a huge library of templates of like done for you pre-built templates that you kind of can go and check out and click around and they're very easy to manipulate. So I found it to be a tremendous resource for just about anything. In fact, I use it as my personal CRM as well. Um, you know, for me not being the most, I'm a little bit of a forgetful person. And so what we developed is something that has every person that I should keep in touch with, how often I want to keep in touch weekly, monthly, quarterly, biannually or annually, um, all my notes, their coffee orders, their kids' names, all, all the stuff that you should remember that I'm not good at remembering. And so when, when the countdown gets to zero, so I put in the last date that I contacted them and then how often I want to speak. And so when that date hits zero, my email gets a thing saying, hey, you should get a hold of this person and, and ask them about X, Y, Z. And so I use it just to keep my personal communication management up to date. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, what, what you've just outlined there, regardless of what tool you use, I think is something that every business should be doing. And that's 
a beautiful example of automation that allows you to build human relationships because you're keeping instead of trying to remember what, what did Mike what, what's Mike really excited about I can make a note in my system of what excites Mike and when I want to touch base with him again to see how he's doing and I can straight away begin the conversation with what excites him and immediately that um, that conversation has gone deeper than just superficial yeah so I think that's yeah I think that is brilliant everybody should be doing something like that whether it's in Airtable or whatever the tool is you use to keep track of that yeah and I, I really believe it's a catalyst to longevity um, if I think about our marketing efforts in the since the time we've been having to market ourselves almost everything is me knowing that i can contact the ceo of xyz and ask him if he has any friends that need marketing you know just you build these relationships you have this real connection with somebody um, beyond just a templated email that goes out um, and that's why even in my lead generation which we may talk about later you know i, I don't i only send personalized videos to people now you know, and I do it to friends and family. You won't, you won't, you'll barely catch me texting. Um, I'm either sending voice notes or I'm sending, uh, I'm sending videos because it's just, you know, connecting with people is really, it's what it's all about. It makes such a big difference in the person's feeling of you, especially if, you know, they're a well that you're going to draw from for clients later or, or any, you know, anything you need. It's, it's good to have a real relationship. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think the video, is really powerful in addition to all the things you've said today because it does differentiate you not a lot of people are doing it yet and so i get a lot of comments back from videos i've sent to people saying what a nice touch to do a video and thanks for taking time and making a special effort what i don't tell them of course is that for me it's probably easier than sitting down and typing out an email and thinking about what I'm going to say because I don't really think about what I'm going to say on the video other than to, okay, I'm going to get in touch with Mike. I'm going to thank him for being on the podcast. I'm going to touch on a couple of things that we talked about on the podcast and that's it. Then I record the video and it's it's me just speaking to yeah. you. And if you're not good at writing like me, it is a godsend. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you use to do those quick videos? Um, I, for the most part, I just use whatever native platform. So if I'm prospecting, I will send video messages on LinkedIn and on Instagram. Um, if it's, you know, friends and family, I just, uh, right through, right through the text or WhatsApp, I'll just send them out. If it's something where, um, if it's something that I'm using as a part of a sequence, I actually use an app called Bonjuro, which is a really cool mm -hmm. app. Um, it's a, uh, it integrates with. Uh, your CRM, so your client relationship manager, and it can trigger you to send a video at any point you want. So what I typically use it for is if somebody joins my email list because they downloaded a resource, I will get that notification. It'll say, Jurgen downloaded your social media piece of content, whatever it is. And then I get a notification right in the app saying your name, what you downloaded, and I can go click one press of a button, brings up a video. I record it. Hey, thanks so much for downloading this. If you have any feedback, let us know, et cetera, et cetera. I click, I click done and it automatically goes out to that person. And the nice thing is that it goes out with a video, like a little page with a video and then a call to action. So if I have something I'm moving them like an upsell or some other piece um, or, you know, join the Facebook group or, or whatever I want to try to get them to go to next, uh, I can actually do that within the context of that video, which is amazing. Hmm. Yeah, I love love Bonjoro, and I've been using that since the very early days when um, I I think I had um, Matt Matt, their CEO um, Matt Barnett, on the show and jumped on the on the thing. I think I can't remember how we connected, but he I know he sent me a Bonjoro message. Yeah, uh, I had him on my podcast for some reason. I had him on my yeah. podcast as well. Yeah, super nice, super nice guy. You you can yeah, yeah. tell that this brand is built around him and his personality fully. Yeah, it is. And, and not only that, it's so focused on customer. I mean, if if you ask me you know, what's a really great customer-focused business that you're aware of right now, Bonjoro would certainly be 
way up there. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I love what they're doing. And and certainly, as you say, it's a great way to follow up with people and build in those sequences and integrate it with the systems that you've already got. Yeah. And I know you were saying that you get the feedback. I keep screenshots of the feedback that I get. People, you know, because I think they're just like great pieces that you can use on social later. But the amount mm. of people that respond blown away. And that's the key with marketing. Just in that, you know, where we're both in that space. If you can make someone feel blown away just by you communicating with them, like how good do you think that works towards getting a sale from that person. And I'm not saying it's all about manipulating them into buying something, but um, you know, it's just amazing when how, how much easier the sales process goes, especially if you're a good match for what they need when they've already been wowed by you in early communication, you know, it's great. Hmm. All right. Now you talked a little bit about what you do for lead generation and outreach. So, um, and I know you're, one of one of the things you're speaking on your speaking topics list is creating content that converts. So, how are those two related? What 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 is key for you when you prospecting for new business? So, I take there's two kind of approaches that I think about when it comes to content. I'm not so much pushing, you know, a, a a lead capture style, a lead magnet style piece of content. Although I know it's very, I know it does work. I like having that stuff available. The way I think about content for the most part is if you are going to, if you're looking for a service provider and it's something that I do, it's also something that tens of thousands of other people do. What I'd like to do is put out content that when you come and hop onto my Instagram or take a look at me and and because you're going to vet me in whatever way you're going to vet me. And I want to make sure that when you take a look at me, all you think is this guy's in it to win it. So I think about, you know, when I'm putting out content, it's really almost never promotional. I'd say maybe 3% of the time it's promotional for me. Everything else is me having conversations like this, sharing ideas, helping other people with their ideas. A big part of the early, like my early podcast was just me giving marketing advice for an hour on my calls. I basically just found people that wanted, wanted a consultation and I offered it for free for the, to get the recording of it. And so I think I've, I carry that through because people can see through advertising, right? People can see through when you're trying to push them into a sale. And I just feel like no matter how you try and mask it, it's always there. People always know. So why, so why do it, right? Be a resource, be helpful, be handy, be trusted. Because when the time comes between you and the person that they know has been pushing a sale, it's just a really easy yes for them. And, and that's the feedback that I get. So I kind of just keep feeding that system, putting out stuff that is helpful and practical without asking for anything back. And it's just amazing what actually comes back from it. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's um, a really great philosophy. I really subscribe to that whole idea. And I think, you know, what, what you've said there is sort of putting out helpful content without any expectation. But the paradox in that is that that actually gives more gives more responses than if you put something out with the intent to get a response. And particularly if you if you slant it towards sales and uh, pushy kind of structure than than just being helpful. Yeah, and and I think I think the end consumer, especially I'm selling business to business. I really am only working with entrepreneurs, um, somebody that that's already in an ownership level, or you know, depending. But, but by and large, it's it's business to business relations for me. I think we're also numb because we all see it, right? We get those those cold mm. emails. I I I t I always respond to them and then I put them on blast on the internet. Someone sent me a message being like, hey, and they left the little parentheses first name because their <laughs> software didn't actually put my first name in. And so I responded back as, as hey, lazy marketer with in parentheses. And email <laughs> but I think it's like, we're so numb to all this stuff. You look at, I think one of the ones that really bothered me 
I was on LinkedIn and some guy wrote about, he was a veteran and um, from the US and he was talking about the impact that having his Amex had on his life. And I was like, okay, that's like, in, it sounds like it's gonna be an advertisement, right? And it went through and it like this really thoughtful story about how he's using, you know, it, that particular card gets him certain points and those points help him get, I can't remember the whole story, but it felt like a genuine story of how this has made a, an impact. And he was just writing it out of like the admiration of the brand. And then right at the bottom, like, oh, this is a, an advertorial sponsored piece of content. Like, oh my God. And <laughs> there's so many times where you read stuff where you're like, this sounds great. Someone's hyping up a software. Someone's talking about a service that this company provided. And then you get to the bottom and you're like, oh no, this is paid for. It's like, great. Mm. I, now don't believe in it at all. And I think now with like affiliate marketing and stuff, that's what 95% of the content you read online is. And so I think yeah. us who are in this space, we can see it like it's nothing. You know, the, the radar is just buzzing every time we read anything. And I think the only way you can fix it is just to go so hard against the grain that, you know, people can't find any flaws in, in what you put out. And that's kind of how I think about it because there's just so much saturation of that type of content that's frustrating mm. so i just try and stay away from it at all costs yeah yeah there's there's a lot in that in terms of you know standing out from the crowd and being genuine and genuinely helpful the, it reminds me i'm doing quite a bit of work at the moment particularly with learning management systems in um, researching what's available and what is best fit for various clients who are in the process of pivoting their in-person events to online training events and it's it's like you say you know if you you do a google search of let's say best learning management system for business coaches which is one that i did recently and the first two pages of the google search are affiliates or advertorial type things where and they will have titles like um, why XYZ is not the best system for you. But when you then read it, it talks, it just sings the praises of XYZ. And clearly, you know, you go two or three sentences in and you realize this is not an objective evaluation and they don't even talk about the other systems or do a comparison or, or talk about pros and cons. It's just how wonderful XYZ is. And so I've, I've discovered my habit there is that I kind of scan through those titles and where it looks like, no, that's just going to be an advertorial or a, a promoted uh, or an, an affiliate review. I'll actually go to page three and four of Google in the search. So I go against this, this wisdom of you've got to be on page one. I go down to page three or four because that's where you start to see the, the people that you know, are writing simply to share their experience as opposed to any any vested interest. Yeah. And I mean, look, it works or they would or else they would do it. I mean, I think mm. that's a huge sales channel for a lot of companies and a lot of brands right now. And um, the average consumer might not think twice. They might say, oh, this glowing review. That's great. They don't read the, 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 the last line on it. I mean, you have to indicate that it's a, a sponsored post, but um you know they, they're obviously it's obviously helping but um yeah. i think i think especially in my space when i'm talking to other entrepreneurs and people that are in creative and consulting it's like we're so used to it that <laughs> mine cannot have any semblance of it or it just won't work <laughs> yeah okay so you put out all this content that solves problems for people and uh, without any expectation in return. So how do you draw the boundary between, okay, this is this is what you get from me simply because I put it out there or if you have a conversation with me, I'll give you this level of assistance. Where do you draw the boundaries? How do you determine that of at this point, you're going to have to pay me something? Yeah. The way I think about it is anything that you can go out and find easily on the internet, I'll put my spin and you can have it. Because the, hmm. the truth is that most of this, most of these ideas and most of this content, everyone, like a lot of people have a take 
Um, it's out there. It's, it's almost like it's almost a commodity at this point. So I will put my insights and my spin because what I know is that if somebody thinks the same way as me, if they hear my version or my take on it, that's what makes them say, I need more of this. I want more of that guy. Right. Otherwise, otherwise, if it was as generic, I think a lot of people put out stuff that's literally just the same as everybody else. And it doesn't resonate at all because there's nothing that stands out. There's not one little mm. piece that makes them say, oh, oh, I, I like that way of thinking about it. Um, and then I think from there, um, what I do is I, I, you know, I create a handful of free events here and there. Um, I do a little bit of free consulting, especially during COVID. I did, I did quite a bit as just a, a way to help and a way to be a resource. But I, I don't have any issue saying, here's the concept. Go like, so here's an example. If you told me strategically, how would I, you know, how do I think about Google ads for my business? I'll tell you from a strategic standpoint, this is how I would kind of think about allocating your spend. Here's kind of the, the path I would go down. And I'm fine to give that because again, you could probably find that resource online. But if you want, you know, technical stuff or you want, you know, my, t my time or my team's time, I have no problem saying, this is where the payment starts. Um, if it's if it's, if it's something that I can't solve in 10, 15 minutes, that's usually where I draw the line. Okay. Hmm. But I think, right. I, yeah, I think I've got a very sorry. I think I've got a very clear conscious about asking for money because I do so little of it. And so I think when when I yeah. say when I say like that's the end of your free info, I'm not leaving it. I'm never leaving it saying here's a three quarter complete thought. Now pay me for the other bit. I always finish that thought, um, but then I just kind of hit that barrier. And I'm like, okay, those are all the thoughts you're getting. <laughs> you can pay me. Mm. For that part. Yeah. 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 And I think that's a really good way to do it as well. I don't, for me, the idea of here's three quarters of the answer to your question, but to get the full answer and to actually be really helpful, <laughs> you have to pay me some more is to me that's just i mean i feel that's sleazy and underhanded i mean either you know if somebody asks a question i would prefer them to say up front well i can work with you and answer that question for you and help you solve that problem but and it's going to cost this much yeah and then i say okay that's fine i have a decision to make now uh, but if he gives me half the answer and and then i'm kind of like okay i want I want I want to finish this and now you have to pay me now. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's a sad state of affairs. I mean, I think there's a lot of predatory marketing, uh, especially in the digital learning space. These these online gurus, I won't use any names, but uh, there's a lot of predatory. You, you're here and you want to be up here where I am. So you have to buy this next package and you get partway through that package and then they've got another package. It's like, there, did you even solve any of the first problem we talked about? And, and most of the time, it's it's preying on desperate people who think there's a get rich quick version of life mm -hmm. or a version of business, and then they end up pumping. I, I talked to a guy the other day. He went through two two tiers of two other programs, and he goes, "I just don't know based on this." And then I said, uh, "I talked to him for 15 minutes. This is my kind of 15 minute cutoff." I said, "I'll, I'll give you 15 minutes of my time." I he, you know, he engages with a lot of my content on Instagram. I said, I'm going to get, I'll give you my time. And I just, the answer to his question was so simple. It was so, so simple. And I said, well, X, Y, and Z, cut out this, cut out this, move that in. And he goes, huh, I've spent over $7,000 on online programs and nobody's told me that. He goes, that makes perfect mm. sense. <laughs> so, mm. you know, there's a lot of that out there, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And I always get suspicious when um, I haven't bought one for a while that's like this, but when you buy a program and immediately the next step before they send you anything else is, oh, here's, here's our upsell, you know, get, get into the, um, into the, what is it? The, the premium version or <laughs> the next version. The, yeah. And, and this will get you that. So you've spent some money and the first thing they tell you is, well, you haven't, we're not going to solve your problem for what you for what you came here for, and what you just bought, because you have to buy some more, mm. which I think is kind of a really bad marketing because it um, it 
shoots them in the foot. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Um, so tell us a little bit about how do you go about packaging that knowledge that you have into products? Because I know you've done quite a bit recently with the pandemic and pivoting your own business with doing um, producing some products based on on your knowledge. How do you strategically go about that? So I think I think where a lot of people make the mistake, and and I've, I'm you know working with a number of people right now. Who, are, who say, well, I offer this service. I'm a graphic designer. I design, you know, emails. I'm a copywriter. I'm a whatever. And that's fine. But that always commands, in my opinion, and from my experience, that always commands an exchange of, of time for money. Hmm. And not to say that you can fully get away from that, but, but it is, it's like, well, I'm going to write 500 words and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pay you this much money or I'm going to make you three pictures and it's going to cost this much money. Um, and what ends up happening is the time for money exchange ends up as some fixed hourly amount that is a, a recognized or an agreed upon thing within the industry, right? Graphic designers get 55 bucks an hour and computer programmers get X amount per hour. And so when you're, when you're exchanging that just by saying, I offer this, this action or this service, you're keeping yourself on the ground of what someone will accept to pay you hourly because there's someone else that can do it for 45 instead of 55. So why don't I use hmm. them? And that's where a lot of people get stuck bargaining and, and, and lowering their prices and trying to compete with this race to the bottom. This whole gig economy thing is a little bit crazy in that sense because it's, you know, everyone's just trying to get whatever the lowest price is. So the way I think about this and the way I get around that is you have to sell the vision, right? You have to sell the results, not the task. You need to, you need to sell the benefit and the benefit of the benefit and not the feature, right? If I do, if I make, if I make graphics for Facebook ads, then I'm a graphic designer who gets paid $55 an hour, right? If I'm, if I'm a designer who creates, who creates Facebook ads that convert at a whatever times percent that makes your customers love you because your ads work faster and they work more efficiently than they ever did before, now there's a compelling reason to pay you more. Right. And I think it's just the story that you tell It's the way that you position it to the person. So you have to think about who it is that you're selling to and what is a win and what is a loss for that person. That's a great place to start. Right. Hmm. So if you are uh, an entrepreneur versus an employee within a company. That thing is going to be different. You both might need a graphic designer, but your need is different. Right. If you're the employee, you know, making sure that the customers stay on board and they're happy or that they, you know, they buy more products or services from you, that's what makes you look good. And if your customers leave because the performance is not good or for whatever reason, that's what, you know, you lose a bunch of customers, you lose your job. Keep your customers happy, happy you get a raise and that's your win. So if that's the case, you need to dive into all those things and, and understand for that person specifically that you're selling to, um, what does you know, if they were king for a day or queen for a day and they could say, this is what the perfect situation is. This is what the perfect customer and client experience looks like for me. Understanding what that is and how that impacts their day to day. And then, and then making sure that you package yourself as something that creates the result, something that gets to that finish line rather than the person who does graphic design. Does that make sense? Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So it really is about focusing on on the result that you achieve as opposed to how you do it. Yeah. And I mean, I think about it, for, it doesn't matter who you are. It's always the same. If an accountant was reaching out to me and I'm a business, so I need an accountant and he says, hey, I'll do your taxes for $2,000 a month or $2,000 a year. Okay, then who will do it for seventeen hundred? Who will do it for fifteen hundred? Mm. Now you're you're a commodity. You're a you're just you're a feature, right? But if you came yeah. and said you came and said, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna manage all the paperwork, deal with all of the headaches 
file your taxes and get you the best return and the best savings on your taxes possible. It'll cost you two grand. I'm like, yeah, because I suck at paperwork. I, um, you know, I'm always worried about having to pay too much in taxes. Like you're all these things as a business owner that I'm worried about, you've just addressed them. And, mm. and you don't even tell me, like, I don't even care that it's you doing taxes. It's, if you can solve any of those problems from any angle, I'm in. Right. And so I think it's it's packaging the results and then even the like the the result of the result or the benefit of the benefit. So what's the next thing? You know, the next thing from that is not being worried when it comes to tax time that something bad is gonna happen. Because we're all we all get that gut, okay, I don't know what I'm gonna oh, I don't know what's gonna happen. You just have this sinking feeling. So if they said, Hey, I'm gonna make sure at tax time that you know exactly what's coming down the pipeline and that you are going to have nothing to worry about. That's even better. I'm super. Mm -hmm. And it's only going to cost me $2,000. Sure. No problem. So it really is kind of how you package it and how you position it that can make, you know, that same dollar amount or a bigger dollar amount seem way more attractive than I'll do your taxes for $2,000. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great example and it highlights a couple of things I think that are sort of fundamental and you touched on them earlier in the conversation, but they're really knowing who your customer is, who it is that you're providing this product now to and secondly, what, what, are, their, what are their needs and their pain points and their issues and problems that you're, you have the ability to solve for yeah. them. Hmm. All right. Well, this is fantastic, Mike. I could geek out on marketing and we haven't touched on customer journey or those things yet. <laughs> and I'm just watching the time a little bit. And um, I think it's a good time now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's designed to help our audience who are primarily leaders and innovators in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us really insightful answers that'll inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result today. Wow, no pressure at all, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think the number one thing is anyone needs to do to be more innovative? I think they need to trust their gut and not trust what is recognized as the thing to do. I say that because uh, during COVID, I gave away a lot of consulting time. I gave away, uh, I offered... Uh, 50 free hours of consulting in 30 minute increments to business owners that needed to figure out how to pivot. And the number one thing, the number one thing that was holding people back is I gave them an idea and they say, well, that's not, that's not really how it works or we can't really do that. Or that's not really the way it sells. And it's like, why? Well, that's just, I don't know. That's just how it goes in our industry. Why? And the third, why was always the answer to the third, why was always, huh? I don't actually know. Mm. And so I really think, you know, be, be disruptive to yourself. Find ways to challenge what, you know, the comfort zone that you're living in all the time. Find new ways and don't go, you know, 180 degrees and just pivot in a completely different direction. But with a small amount of effort and a small amount of time and a small amount of resource, challenge your norms and try and find hidden opportunities, not by saying this is how people do it, by saying, I wonder if this could work. I wonder if this could happen mm. and just play with it. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So a bit of curiosity. Actually, <laughs> you reminded me of a funny story when you said that, you know, we've always done it this way and you ask why the third time they, well, I don't know. Uh, the, you know the story of the, the why, why the standard gauge railway is, is whatever the, the distance is? No. No, well, uh, it turns out that that standard gauge railway, and it's, I mean, it's a little different in different parts of the world. And in Australia, we've even got differences between states. So when you cross state borders in the railway, they have to swap swap carriages and stuff. But anyway, the the background is that this, this goes back to um, the time when it was horse and carriage. So they actually figured out, uh, so it was actually the width of the carriages that were around as as railways were invented and starting mm. to be built and the width of those so it was the wheels of the carriage 
and the width of those wheels of the carriage was determined by the in old Roman days by the chariots that they had. Now those chariots were pulled by two horses, so the width was determined by the width required for those two horses. So the, the story, the sort of the bottom line is that uh, the you know the width of standard gauge railway today is determined by the size of two horses backsides <laughs> <laughs> back from back to over 2000 years ago <laughs> amazing i did not know that mm. that's interesting and no and yeah nobody's ever sort of questioned whether you know is there a is there a reason today that makes sense to have that width a certain width right <laughs> So yeah, it's a bit like that. You know, we've always done it this way. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? I think, I think very similar to what I just said. It's, it's, you know, what I think about it the most like this. I look at how other businesses in completely different industries market. Hmm. And I, I got, a, I got a firsthand glimpse of this because while I was running my business, I, I. As like uh, as I was trying to get ramped up, I was working for a Google Premier partner, and I worked with hundreds of different businesses, helping them develop solutions. So I got to see a lot of different, a lot of different mm -hmm. businesses and how they came up with their marketing and what was successful. And you know, for me, it was always learning what they did in in the non digital, and then saying, okay, how can we make that online so it's more efficient, but but not deviating from what was generating their customers before. And so I think. Um, looking at how not your competitors are doing it but things in you know completely different industries are doing it and then say huh wonder if that could work for us maybe there's an adaptation maybe there's a version of it that could work for us and then test test and play a little bit of attention a little bit of energy a little bit of money test and then if it works then figure out ways to expand it and grow it if it doesn't work then throw it away <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I love the love the idea of looking outside your own industry and and even even completely unrelated things and and drawing the dots back to what's needed in inside of your own little space. And the test and play of course, that's really important sort of try things out. All right, now you mentioned Airtable before, what's one of the resources you use most often? Uh, Airtable runs most of my life, so definitely Airtable. Um, mm. What else? I'm such a junkie for tools. Um, <laughs> well, Bonjoro, Bonjoro is there, right? <laughs> Bonjoro, um, you know, a really good, easy to program, robust CRM. I mean, Airtable is great for organizing mm. certain things, but I use Active Campaign for email marketing and for helping us make analytical decisions based on what path people go, whether it's on the web, whether it's in our, you know, marketing correspondence, who responds to what, and, and our ability to make decisions based on how people interact. It's the, it's the next best thing behind what, what are people doing on the website uh, is what are people doing, you know, what can you track in your CRM, like an active campaign, for example, that can shape your, uh, content and also marketing decisions. Hmm. Great. Okay. Well, there's quite a few there. So that, yeah, the tracking kit, that's a really important part of marketing, isn't it? Sort of getting an understanding of what people are actually doing with, in, in the case of active, active campaign, I guess, with your emails or what they're doing on the website. Um, and, and I know with Bonjoro, you get a sense of how many people, well, how much people have watched of the video, how often they've watched it and how they interacted with the call to action. Yep. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a client on track? That's a, that's something that I will give my, my sister a pat on the back for. Um, we, you know, for me, the way we thought about this, and it's going to be different for every business, but the way that we thought about it was, what are the number one reasons why people leave? So stepping back before that, in your sales process, how do you have the, how do you have the best sales process under the sun? You ask, you answer the question, why would they say no? What's every single reason why this person would say no to me? And then how do I collateralize that 
to make, you know, to, to get them on the right path and make them understand what they need to understand about us and to say yes, if again, if it's the right fit and if you can do a great job for them. So I think about it like this. What is the number one people leave, right? Shiny object syndrome. They, they hear about something else or they they want to expert, they, you know, they watch a YouTube video over the holidays. In the marketing industry, the first two weeks of January is when you get calls from everyone saying, Hey, I was talking to this other company and I kind of like this idea. Like I, the first year that happened to me, I was devastated. And I was like, oh, this is like every year you get a break in the holidays. You're watching a bunch of YouTube videos on how to improve your business and you have shiny object syndrome. Oh, I want to be on TikTok now. We're going to do this. Okay, great. But we're going to do the fundamental stuff too. So I think it's like, that's one thing. Um, they don't feel like they they have a good connection with you. They don't feel like they know transparently what's going on. Like those are the reasons that people leave marketing agencies, right? Someone else comes in and tells them they can do a better job. They're like, I don't know how my results are going. I'm not educated. So education is a big one. And what we did is we just built systems to counter all of it, right? We made sure that each of our customers understood how Facebook ads worked. And we would walk them in, like like bring them into the campaigns and explain how the how it's reported, some of the KPIs, let them ask every question under the sun and leave them very educated. Because then if something's going well, they can assess that for themselves. They're not relying on you being like, this is going great, right? If they know how to assess it, then they can say, are you good or are you bad? And so for every kind of reason why people would want to leave us as a company, we tried to build either education or materials or give them a heads up. Like one of the weirdest things with like Facebook ads and Google ads, like, you know, the first month is always the, the rockiest because they're like, is this going to work? I've been burned before. I don't know. There's no conversions yet. What's going on? Why is Facebook? Why does Facebook keep charging me $5 over and over and over again? So like we would give like a what to expect. Hey, Facebook bills on credit and it's weird and you're going to get a whole bunch of Facebook charges. It's completely normal just so you're aware of it. Because you don't, if you don't answer that question, if you don't handle that complaint or objection ahead of it, they're going to get it and be like, Mike, what is going on? When is Facebook going to stop billing me? They're billing me four times a day. What's happening? And they feel like they're out of control and that you don't know what's going on. So think about anything that would be annoying to them or biggest piece is what would make them not work with you anymore and try and build materials and resources to um, give them education or give them uh, knowledge about what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really great advice. And certainly with, I mean, that Facebook example with, if you're using third party services where the, the client's going to be billed by the third party, or they're going to get communications from that third party, then knowing what to expect is a really important thing. Yeah. Well, especially nowadays, like you need to go through like seven ad rejections before you can get anything running on a new ad account. So it's mm -hmm. like, Hey, you're going to get 30 emails and they're all going to say your ads have been declined and it goes against our community standards. It's not anything to worry about. Like it's coming. So, you know, yeah. because it's like, you know, if I got that as a consumer and I had no idea, I'd be like, do these people not know what they're doing? Like why hmm. they keep getting all these, why is everything getting rejected? They must have no idea hmm. what they're doing. That's what a, that's what a customer would think. Right. So trying to get ahead of all that stuff. Great. All right. And what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Ha. Take the time to send meaningful correspondence. Um, you can send hundreds of cold emails a day. You can send 150 cold LinkedIn sequenced text messages every day. But the truth is that if you are actually legitimately targeting your dream client, the person that could actually use your help, the person that you could make an impact on their business, and you're wasting that by sending them a message that they get 30 of from other people and they can tell that it's a prepackaged thing. And look, I'm not saying not to do it at all because I get it. It helps you reach more people and it's way, you know, but, but I think depending on the type of business that you are, the numbers, the numbers play out differently to me. If you only need you know, 10 customers a year, why are you sending messages to thousands? Mm. You could probably video message the top 150 and get 10 deals, right? So thinking about who you are and what you're trying to do, if you need to scale, like if you're a SaaS product or you're, 
you know, something like that where you need to hit a scale of people, you can't be video messaging. I, I was doing I was doing 40 a day, 150 a total a week for a while. And like, it's tiring. It's really, really tiring. Um, so if you know, if, if you, you may need, it may not work that way. But if you offer something that's, you know, mid to high ticket, and that thing is based on that person needing to trust you, or you need to having a real relationship with them, I recommend put down the automation, use tools to source that list and find you the hit list, but then take the time to send the video because even if you can only send 10 a day, you're getting 60% response rate instead of a 0.25% response yeah. rate on, on the 100. And, and it's gonna net out to an easier sale because that person's gonna have inherent trust in you because you've taken the time already. So that, that's the number one thing. Hmm. And, and you know, there's so much there to love and it basically comes back to making marketing human. It's mm -hmm. um, very much so leaving aside the automation. I like that part. Um, you know, you've got to, I, I heard somebody say once you've got to earn the right to get up to automation. So it's not, you know, you don't put automation in by default first. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You know, you, you and I are of the same school of thought on it. And I think, um, Again, if you're if you're somebody who needs to pick up a handful of clients here and there, and you know that there's a hundred people that are perfect, just the perfect type of person, you know that you can help their business, you feel like they're going to respond well. Your you know corporate cultures match, like build the relationship. <laughs> just go have that yeah. conversation, you know. And it's intimidating. Sending video and audio messages is intimidating, and it takes uh, practice. It takes time. It takes shaking off the nerves of being in front of a camera. I get it. It's not, mm. it's not easiest, but the impact um, and the success is going to be worthwhile. Mm. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. This has been fabulous. Now, where can people reach out and find out more about you and learn about what you do, listen to the podcast, and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, very active on LinkedIn, Mike Mall. Um, and my website is marketme.co and you'll find, um, you'll find the podcast, you'll find my contact information is, is on there. So marketme.co, C-O, um, and then on LinkedIn, Mike Mall. Great. We'll have links to those on the show notes. Now, do you have some parting advice for our listener today? Um, here's what I would say, cause I, I, you know, with the whole pandemic thing, this would tip not be my typical advice. In fact, my the message to myself on my phone, uh, I'm actually thinking about um, I'm actually thinking about making it softer. Th this has been here for this has been here for uh, this has been here for over six years, and it says uh, it was, my motivation was that nobody cares about what you're doing. Don't forget that. And I think like I think it's so true, but I think you know it's weird. The pandemic is kind of like kind of mixed up everybody's brains. And I think it's, I think it's started to humanize some and, and dehumanize others, but here's what I would say. Um, take, take time to think outside the box because the way that we do marketing, the way that we do business and the way that we communicate is going to change dramatically and rapidly over the next couple of years. Um, I think people are leaving companies to go, you know, offer their service as a, a freelancer. I think businesses are hiring different. They're thinking about, you know, collaboration and teamwork different. And there's just, you know, there's going to be a different set of needs and a different set of demands. Um, and I think really now is the time to really start thinking, what is it going to be like when everybody's remote and you're going to be, you know, the company that you're going to be interviewed by is going to be on a Zoom call with people from six on six different screens. What do you need to do differently? What is going to make you stand out? And just thinking about it for you, whether it's the next job or your next client, is really thinking, how can I do it differently? How can I make an impact? And how can I make people remember who I am? Hmm. Yeah, I love it. And uh, particularly, you know, the idea that going forward, things are going to be slightly different. There's a lot that we've learned in... Uh, the force pivot that most businesses are having to do or have done during 
this pandemic and and so there's lots of things that probably will stay with us going forward because yeah. people realize there's benefits to going online you can reach more people um in a wider geographic space and so some of those things are going to continue and so it's it's worth considering how can we how can we factor that into our planning yep absolutely and like i you know it really kicked me in the face about five months ago we had a product that we did the same same method of generating leads forever 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 and it was you know it was a forty thousand dollar a month service for us and in a week in a week it dropped to zero and i haven't seen mm. one i haven't seen one dollar from it in six months wow because <laughs> it's just not it's not the style of product that people need in this current ecosystem of marketing so it's crazy i mean it can it can change that fast and so um really important to again think about think about think about how uh people need service now what is what is the version of what you do that makes mm. sense for people now and, and constantly be challenging that and be ready for the next weird thing that happens or the next you know <laughs> next thing you're gonna have to focus on yeah to change. yeah all right well that's great thanks now finally who else should i get on this show and why uh, have you had Simon Hall? On no, I haven't. Oh, he's amazing. He's just the nicest, most, he's just so in touch with, uh, he's a, basically his business builds communities. That's all he does. Mm. And yeah. uh, he's living in uh, Bali for quite a while. And he's just such a great spirit, uh, really insightful. He's got a lot of really interesting things to say around uh, how, you know, how we focus our lives and, and spirituality and stuff, but in, in not in a super religious way, just, you know, being in tune with ourselves and, uh, yeah, he's a really interesting guy. I talked to him. All right. Well, we'll get an introduction from you to Simon and we'll get in touch with him and see if we can get him on the show as well. Bali's Absolutely. actually quite convenient in terms of the time zone difference. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thanks, Mike, so much for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today. I've really enjoyed this immensely. I, I've had a wonderful time chatting with you on the Market Me podcast, and we've just kept um, kept channeling that conversation further and digging deeper into some of the marketing aspects. So thanks for all of that. All the best for the future, and let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed that very informative and engaging conversation with Mike and took something away from his episode. My key takeaway was Mike's recommendation to sell the vision, the results you help your clients to achieve in a way that's aligned with their current problem, their current need or loss. I'd love to know what you took away from Mike's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Mike Moll. That is M-I-K-E-M-O-L-L. -L. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Mike Moll. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Mike there, as well as links to his website, to the Market Me podcast, to his social media pages and the other resources we spoke about in today's conversation. Now, if you like this episode, please share it with two other people that it might help. We want to get the word out to as many people that can get value from these wonderful guests that I have on the show. Tag me on that share and I'll reach out to you with a really special surprise. Mike suggested that we have a conversation with entrepreneur, writer and podcaster Simon Hall on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So Simon, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Mike Moll. And tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got even more fantastic guests lined up including Brendan Kumarasamy of Master Talk and Tendai Vicky, author and innovation expert. Thanks for listening to this episode. 
Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.